Um, okay, people are still joining here. Um, I guess I might make a bit of a start though. Um, hello uh, all and, and thanks for, for joining us on uh, what's uh, certainly a, a sunny um, evening in Dublin. Um, I know people are, are tuning in from all over. So uh, yeah, hi and welcome. Um, I'm just just going to introduce myself. My, my name is Nathan O'Donnell. Um, I am a currently writer in residence at Maynooth University. Um, and this is the, the fourth event in a public program, which I'm organizing as part of this residency uh, on experimental publishing. Um, so I want to say thanks at the outset to Maynooth University um, uh, and to uh, Kildare Arts Office, and particularly to uh, Una Maynooth, who, who oversees the, the residency program, and to Lucina at the Arts Office, um, who've been really great support um, throughout. Uh, this has been, a, yeah, it's been a really, really wonderful opportunity for me to, to I guess, to develop my own work as a writer and, and as someone who, who publishes. Um, a distinction that I guess I'm starting to feel less and less uh, tenable, um, to be honest. Uh, but it's also been really useful, uh, and and um, it's been a great opportunity I've found to explore and invite other really interesting practitioners uh, who've been undertaking work in this field. Um, in the talks that have happened so far, I, I'm hoping that a kind of composite picture is emerging of what this 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 broad-ranging field uh, of experimental publishing looks like. Um, the term itself, I mean, I've, I've been beginning each session with a sort of probably reductive attempt to summarize what's meant by experimental publishing. Um, but at its most simple, I guess it refers to the work of practitioners and projects that use publishing as a site of experimentation. Um, so it includes work that, 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 I guess, that expands our idea of what publishing, as in the act of making public, can be. It's a field that crosses disciplinary boundaries and artistic forms, um, exploring and forging new approaches to this act of making public. Um, and so I suppose it, it, it's worth acknowledging, I mean, it spans a lot, a lot of different formats and forms, artist publishing, political and protest publishing, underground publishing, uh, things like the Samizdat and the Zine, I think, would 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 uh, fall within this this um, this broad field, uh, and it, it does entail, in many cases, a critique of the conventions and politics uh, of conventional publishing, um, with the sort of associated ideas of the author, the book has commodity form, the literary marketplace, mm -hmm. um, and there's a kind of implicit um, critique of copyright that's that's present throughout. Uh, 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 but it also radically expands the possibilities of publishing uh, as a process, as performance, uh, as a space for participation and learning. Um, and it involves a whole host of strategies and processes here, um, embracing kind of collective, collaborative, provisional, political, anonymous or participatory processes, which in different ways uh, disrupt the received conventions of the book, of publishing, of authorship, um, and which also open up new publics, new channels, new points of connection. Um, and that's something that I know tonight's speaker, Eva Weinmeyer, is going to speak about. Um, it's really a, a privilege to be joined by Eva this evening. Um, Eva is a, a, a researcher, an artist, an educator, a publisher, um, currently based in London and Gothenburg. Uh, she's co-founder of AND Publishing, a feminist publishing platform and collaborative practice based uh, in Loth London and Gothenburg, exploring the politics and infrastructures of publishing and dissemination uh, by asking why publish, how and for whom. Uh, in 2020, she completed her doctoral thesis on the subject Noun to Verb, an investigation into the micropolitics of publishing through artistic practice. Um, and again, I think this is something that we'll, we'll be speaking a bit about tonight. Um, uh, she's currently a HDK Valland project leader uh, of the EU-funded collective research and study program Teaching to Transgress Toolbox, concerned with intersectional feminist approaches to arts and education. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Eva. At this point, we'll keep questions till the end of the talk, as we have done in the previous sessions. Um, you can log them as we go along using the chat function, but we'll, we'll, we'll sort of, I think we'll address them at the end. Um, Eva, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to, to, to this and to the conversation afterwards. I'll drop out now and I'll rejoin at the end. So um, over to you.
Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nathan, uh, for this great introduction and also um, inviting me to this context um, of, of the program. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that deal with um, collective publishing practices, with um, uh, publishing practices that are contextual and situated. And as you already mentioned, Nathan, I recently finished uh, this PhD in artistic practice at HDK Wahland in, in Gothenburg, which the PhD, the thesis I titled Noun to Verb, and it's uh, investigating the micropolitics of publishing for collective and intersectional practice. And I started the PhD because I always thought that publishing is in some way an outright positive and constructive act, an act of uh, giving and taking voice. Um, but that perspective got destabilized and um, once I understood in which ways publications can turn and do turn into, into assets um, in systems of audit and, and cultural capital. And I wanted to explore the powers and the, the micropolitics at play, um, the blockages um, for collective um, and intersectional feminist practice. So um, I first talk about a couple of projects. And uh, in these projects, um, these projects deal with the relationship between sharing and publishing, collectivity, um, they deal with authorship, the relationship between authorship and ownership. Um, they deal with the um, assumed fixity of a book and, and the authority it produces. And then I will um, talk about the decisions um, on, around developing and publishing the PhD thesis itself um, on a media wiki or in, fo in form of a media wiki, um, which then turned also into a practice-based experiment. So it was not just uh, writing up the thesis, it was trying to find a format um, that does not fall in, in the same traps that I'm uh, critiquing in, in, with my other research. Um, and there, an, an interesting friction, of course, um, uh, developed when a PhD, which is sort of expected to be an original contribution to knowledge, um, embarks on a collaborative platform, a media wiki, and um, when all the practice projects are collaboration. So, but I'll talk about this uh, in the second part of the talk. Um, I will actually use um, the media wiki as a as a tool, as a presentation tool, and I'll copy um, the link in the chat. I think it it was also in the announcement, but can oh, this is only going to the panelists, panelists and attendees. One second. So I hope you see the link, but I'm also screen sharing, so. That should work. Okay, just trying to get rid of these little images. <laughs> okay, I hope you're now seeing my screen. If not, somebody needs to shout. So, Nathan um, mentioned end publishing and end publishing was founded in 2010 together with um, artist Lynn Harris after lots and lots of experiences with publishing. So as an artist, I published with um, small independent publishers, with big publishing houses, with international publishing houses, with activist presses and publishing was a super important means because we all know it, you, you escape the hierarchies of, of the market. Um, you can produce relatively cheap and easily uh, circulating um, vehicles, vehicles to, to carry ideas. 
Um, but over the years, I got more and more interested in, in the infrastructures of production and distribution. Um, so the questions of um, how does the book, the scene, whatever you produced finds its reader, or what is the social life of a book? How and where is it embedded? How does it live in the world? In the world, and how does it create meaning? And um, and at the very beginning, was very interested in in print on demand. Um, because of the immediacy, so you didn't need upfront funding um, to, to, to make a book. It, it was very um, quick and responsive and, um, yeah, <laughs> very responsive. Um, it, it was also contextual and dialogical. It was uh, co community-based. Um, and the name end for end publishing is kind of programmatic as, as it's it's accumulative it's not either or um, our practice is quite messy and it's not about creating a unified face or a marketable publishing brand um, it's more like here it houses more sort of um, activities it's it's a feminist practice it's a, it's radical pedagogy it's um about creating informal support structures. It's about sharing a studio, um, sharing resources, skills and, and means of production. And, and we try to redistribute budget, budgets when we get some and commission work and republish out of print or, or hard to find material. Um, and had a um, residency in 2018 in Stockholm and we produced this poster. Um, it gives you a good idea of the complexity and, and messiness of our practice. And our, in this case, is Rosalie Schweiker, that's Rosalie, um, and myself. And the poster was produced for a project, Boxing and Unboxing, which we developed during this residency, Marabu Park and Kunsthalle in Stockholm where we organized boxing training um, for self-identifying women. And I, I want uh, quickly to read out the poster. Why do we publish? What are we publishing? How do we publish? What does it mean to understand our work, not as a noun, but as a verb? Where do we put the many things we are doing that don't fit into boxes? What's the problem with categorization? How do we resist the demand for individual authorship? Why do we not want a unified face? How can we subvert the social pressure to work about politics? What's the problem with writing a colophone in the book? How do we negotiate with institutional bodies? Why would we go on a residency when we struggle to pay rent at home? Where can we store our boxes? How long does it take to travel to Stockholm from London by train? Why do we all speak English? Why is what we are doing called research or education and not art? Where did we meet? What happens if we don't work together anymore? Who has invited us and why? How are we spending the budget? Do we want to stay in a two bedroom or one bedroom apartment? Do you want tea? Have you read the SCAP manifesto? What's the Wi-Fi password? Which objects didn't we bring because we were worried they might get stolen? How do we make this residency visible? Who has the time to end? Oh, who has the time to engage? What can we make public? When does the residency end? Who would be our ideal boxing teacher? What happens if we hurt ourselves? Who gives in? Who compromises? Who accommodates? Who cares? Who edits? Who organizes? Who translates? Do we need a, a new, less tired and exclusive language to talk about all of this? And how do you document laughter? Um, so during this residency, we wanted to learn how to box and unbox because we wanted to learn more about nonverbal negotiation, care, anger, dialogue, transgressions, and self-defense. It was an experiment to explore whether sparring, 
when we defined it as physical play and not as uh, or not geared towards victory or defeat, where the sparring could help to rehearse ways to relate to each other in other areas. And there is something interesting in sparring because you become vulnerable and you learn about the boundaries that you are normally trying to protect. Sparring is a bodily dialogue. It has to do with the mutuality of the touch. So my fist touches and is being touched at the same time. Um, so I'm quickly showing you other projects like here, the Library of Omissions and Inclusions, which is basically, uh, now I go here, which is um, a community run, here, yeah, which is a community run uh, library that gathers feminist intersectional and post-colonial materi materials that are not or only sparsely available in institution and collect collections or databases. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, I really had to make decision on which project I focus. And so I'm just touching on, on this quite big library project, which um, deals with the politics of access, but also the politics of cataloging, classifying, framing knowledges like the, the power to name and, and to organize. And um, another project which I really only mention is the Piracy Project. It's, it's a huge project, a five years project. So I need a whole talk to talk about this, but it's basically um, a, a collection of copied, modified and pirated books. And the whole project explores the philosophical, legal and the social implications of cultural piracy. Um, then we've got Let's Mobilize What is Feminist Pedagogy and that is um, a working group and a three-day mobilization that really redefines um, the format of a conference and, and knowledge practices. And that was a working group and this mobilization, a three-day event taking place at the Art Academy where I was doing my PhD. So what all these projects have in, co in common is that they are collective. Um, collective is important for me because I consent not to be single. I am populated by others. Collec collective because I'm convic convicted that any knowledge practice is from its very beginning always collective. And collective because I don't believe in the individual genius or the concept of originality that a traditional understanding of authorship uh, wants to make us believe. So with this backdrop, I set out to explore what are the blockages for intersectional feminist and collective publishing practice. And to summarize it, I found mainly three inter interrelated concepts. Um, and the one has to do with the idea that a book is a finished object, like a finite object. Um, so that's the problem of, of fixity. And the second has to do with the attribution of authorship and with our understanding what an author is. And the third one is the sort of mutual reciprocity between authorship, authorization and authority. Like, um, you need to be authorized to be an author and then you produce authority. So this is this sort of mutual coercive reciprocity, um, especially when it comes to systems of audit or cultural capital. So um, in, the, in, in, in these projects, I wonder how could we expand our understanding of what constitutes a publication? Um, for example, could practice itself be understood as a form of publishing, like a teaching situation, for example, a workshop, a seminar, a, a group dialogue, where knowledge is collectively created and shared at the same time, could this be considered publishing? And what kind of publics are necessary or relevant to a publication process, a collaboration, a collective, a scene, a process, a dynamic, a method, 
Can we frame any such situation or process as publishing? How fixed or stable does the transmission of knowledges need to be in order to be called a publication? And what is the function and the effect of such um, stability? Um, this is an illustration by Rosalie Schweiker for my PhD. And one concept, um, so the first one was fixity and the second one is, is ownership. And the idea of stability and fixity and the concept of a book as a finite and self-contained object um, has to do with the understanding of ownership because the book, the concept of a book as a discrete object immediately activates the idea that this discrete object can and has to be owned. So it's, it's really about disentangling this reciprocity between authorship and ownership through intellectual property. But even the understanding of what an author is, is pretty complicated. Because how do we, for example, attribute authorship? So it now I'm speaking now about attribution of authorship not the authoring itself. So it's the external reception of this act. So how do we attribute authorship when things have been collectively produced? And this question is even more urgent when the roles and contributions to this collective work are fluid and messy and the roles are shifting. So who, who are the ones who authored this book? The ones that triggered the idea to the book in a late night conversation over drinks? Uh, the ones who did the work of writing, researching and editing? The ones who provide the rooms to host the meetings or make coffee or tidy up afterwards? Which of these roles are valued as a form of authoring? And this is um, where this problematic triangulation of authorship, authorization and authority comes into play. And, and it's difficult. So I wonder, perhaps we need an entirely different understanding of authorship. And the etymology of the word author tells us that it derives from Latin augere, to increase, to augment, to augment, to the author was somebody who causes to grow a promoter, a producer, an instigator, a maker, a doer, a responsible person or a teacher, a person that invents or causes something. And I think this is really interesting because an understanding of the author as an instigator or teacher is somebody who causes something really expands the concept of authorship beyond a so-called output, a discrete object that is bound to a tangible and fixed form, the book. The author as instigator would shift our understanding from the discrete object, the book, to a dialogic process, to the activities and processes of making, of learning, of reading, of making meaning. Therefore, an understanding of authorial practice as instigating would be fundamentally collective and in motion. And this is why I titled my research, my thesis, From Noun to Verb, because I argue for a shift of taxonomies of value, namely from the finished object, the book, the noun, to the ways and processes we do them, the verb. Christoph Kelty, for example, asks, um, what would happen if we valued not solely the content of utterances that are freely and openly circulated, but also the ways in which they are uttered? And then who is encouraged to say them and who is encouraged to remain silent? So this focus on the processes also means that our existing institutional systems of evaluation of audit and cultural capital would need to create new criteria, criteria that evaluate the quality and the inclusivity of the making rather than the quantity of outputs. And it's not easy because a quantitative assessment um, that 
based on a logic of calculation is always much more straightforward. How many books? What's your citation score? Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And here publications turn into an asset. They are a currency for cultural capital, future employment and livelihood. This is of course in, in, in scholarly context, in academia, but it's also um, in the art context. Um, there's not much difference. And, and this is the problem because the question that we actually should ask is not like, what is your citation score, but what is the agency of the book? What does it do or what does it move? And here the concept of a prop might be helpful. It's interesting when Fred Moten and Stefano Harney in their um, book, The Undercomings, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, um, talk about the ways their kids use props. For example, cardboard, cardboard packaging of a, of a fridge. Um, that is a prop for a house they live in. They say, if you pick it up, the prop, you can move into some new thinking and into a new set of relations and interactions, a new way of being together, thinking together. In the end, it's this new way of being and thinking together that's important and not the prop. So I wonder whether a publication could take on a similar role. And if so, um, there would be a fundamental shift from valuing the object as a discrete, countable and accountable output to valuing what it does, like valuing it for its agency to move into new relations and as a tool for thinking together. Um, I want to give you an example. When the feminist pedagogy, the working group at HDK Valand organized this three day international event, the Let's Mobilize, um, we were trying to fundamentally redefine the format of knowledge practice in a, in a conference. Um, we were investigating methods and strategies, how we could organize a conference that pays as much attention to the formats and the ways we meet um, as to the content. Um, so um, let me move to the page. Um, so the, these, were, these were questions we, we started with. Um, and um, what's, what's important when we, um, when we think about the shift of terminology from conference to mobilization, um, there is a different mindset. mindset. So you go to a conference because you expect to listen to papers. I mean, that's a quite traditional um, understanding of conference, but it's a traditional format. Whereas when you go to a mobilization, um, the, the, the focus shifts on, on that, what is being mobilized. Um, and we, we, <laughs> we, we try to redefine these formats, um, experiments with languages, with spatial conventions, um, with temporality. So we did a sleepover in, in the lecture hall um, as, as part of the mobilization in order to ask when, when do we learn? Um, do we learn when we fall asleep together? Um, so, and in this, um, within this context of the mobilization, sorry for this long scrolling, I need to get to the end of the page, it's here. We also created a workbook and the workbook was circulated four weeks before the mobilization. And here questions of distribution were super important because we wanted to invite the academy community into a conversation. Um, let me make this, oops, smaller. <laughs> yeah, into, we wanted to invite the academy community into a conversation um, over, over the topics um, of, of the mobilization. 
And, and that meant we used the workbook as a tool for a social um, gathering. So <laughs> let's let's go back to this um, to this question of distribution. Like distribution of a, of a publication can be seen as a as a rather technical um, act, a control act, a controlled act of delivering an object from a central point to a known target. Um, there's a different conception of dissemination. Um, or distribution, which is dissemination, um, which might come closer to what I'm interested in. Dissemination ha has the nuance of spreading amorphously or in an unstructured manner. It develops a life on its own with its temporalities and its trajectories. So knowledge, for example, can in some way be disseminated, but it can't be distributed. Because dissemination is an offer, it's, and its scope is to propagate. Dissemination comes from Latin semina, and it suggests the spreading of a seed through wind or insects or birds. And there is not, there's no expectation of an immediate um, outcome or effect. It's an offer. So seeds take their time. Once they find the right conditions, they germinate. So. The workbook um, had the dissemination of the workbook had two strands. One was uh, these two images you are seeing now um, to assemble your own copy of the book. And this unconventional approach, like to merge the moments of production and distribution, created a different sense of engagement with the object and its and its top topics. So readers had had time. Um, to invest and in, to invest in manual labor in producing their copy. And as you see, people were sitting together while folding the books. It created a social occasion where people with different roles at the academy um, who rarely met in day to day life sat around tables chatting to each other while folding, collating, and binding um, their copies of the book to take away. And then there was a second strand, um, which I call the walkable book. And this is, um, we hung the posters, like we blew these pages up into big posters and um, hung them across the academy building. And, um, it was interested, interesting uh, how the posters were spread across the walls. Um, and because normally when you think of a publication, and actually I have one, uh, I, I have one here. I don't know whether you see this now because I'm sharing my screen. I can um, show it later. Um, the, the idea is that a publication which, has, which is bound has a fixed sequence of pages. So you're flipping through the pages and it's a, it's a, it's a, con, it's a controlled sequence. Whereas turning the academy in a walkable book means um, that your own body as, as somebody who walks through the academy building sort of creates um, an own trajectory and an own sequence of pagination of, of pages. Um, we were, we were, um, trying to cover as much areas as possible in the building, like thinking of spaces with heavy footfall, like main entrance, kitchen, um, as well as toilets where people would have time to sit um, a bit <laughs> and read the content. Um, and, and these large, large scale printed uh, posters left a trace long after the event um, had passed. And I think it's a good example for a contextual and situated publishing practice um, because what, what has been mobilized in our institution became more important than the book itself. 
like critically experimentation, citation and reference practice practices, social bondings of people. So many collective projects were informed by um, the mobilization, not alone by the mobilization, but to a, to a degree. Um, yeah, so there has been there has been mobilizations. And um, the question, like the more general question is, like how can a book act politically? And we are all familiar with books with radical content, but often these books stop short with, with, with their political contents. And with my PhD and with my practice, I'm interested in how all these processes leading up to a publication and how the processes of its circulation could actually practically intervene and disrupt and change existing systems of production, distribution and consumption of knowledge. And this um, brings me to the second part of this talk, um, the wiki as a PhD thesis. And so you, you've seen a little bit of the wiki. Um, so this is the structure. Um, we also have a contents page. Uh, Um, so the, the wiki allows, the, the wiki, there are formal functional decisions why to use a media wiki for a PhD thesis. It, um, it, it's mighty model, it, it allows moving image sound, it can link to other original sources, web pages, it's, it's a sort of archive of documentation. Um, also embedding, um, embedding original resources in, in the bibliography it turns the uh, traditional understanding of bibliography as a list of references into some sort of, of library. Um, so I try to make as, as much materials um, available as possible. So these are the more functional things of the wiki, um, but the wiki also Let me go to the piracy. The wiki is also um, a sort of epistemic method, a method of knowledge practice. So for example, um, in the piracy project, a collaboration with artist Andrea Franke, a five years project, super intense. And now I'm starting to write a PhD about this project. And this bears huge dangers. It bears the danger that it's only my perspective um, that I frame the collaborative project in, in my understanding and um, that I cemented and I historicize um, the project. So it was important to me to include Andrea's voice. And that could, that could be done in a media wiki and um, Varia, uh, coders in Rotterdam customized the wiki code and allowed for this comment annotation column here. So Andrea commented on my description of the project and these comments are, are, um, uh, are really adding different perspectives and disagreements and um, it, it allows to give this thesis um, different and several layers of commentary which could respond to each other. It's important because if you think of um, that it creates a certain friction with the premise of an academic PhD, which is expected to be individually authored and an original contribution to knowledge. So this multi-vocality multi um, is a way to to counter or to mitigate this. Then there's another aspect, an epistemic um, method, which is important. And this is that I developed the writing, I developed the thoughts online. So I didn't work on a Word document and saved it on my hard disk and opened it the next morning. No, it was all online. 
And it's quite daunting to develop unresolved and tentative ideas and concepts online. Um, but that has to do with sharing and this has to do with thinking with and returning and to be response able. So I, I go um, to the analysis chapter where I can read you just to be a bit clearer um, what I mean with to allow to be response able. So I would so I write if we imagined knowledge practices not to be housed in a university building but in a compost pile we might be able to imagine a different ecology, one that turns the directional forces of in and out, I'm talking here about input and output, into a multi-directional thicket of turning over and over again. Or in Karen Barat words, we might imagine returning as a multiplicity of processes, such as the kinds earthworms revel in while helping to make compost or otherwise being busy at work and at play, turning the soil over and over, ingesting and excreting it, tunneling through it, borrowing all means of aerating the soil, allowing oxygen in, opening it up and breathing new life into it. Um, what I'm so interested in is the question um, between sharing and publishing. So this metaphor of Karen Barat, a compost pile as a publishing um, ecology, where uh, would, it's a decentralizing ecology and it could help to rethink both authorship and citational ecologies as distributed economies of feeding, digesting, excreting and transforming. And um, yes, uh, I think I'll stop here. I'm sharing my screen and um, I, it would be great to have some time um, for a discussion or for your question. That, is, that was great, Eva. Uh, I've taken so many notes here just, uh, just listening to this. Um, and I, yeah, I, 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 I could, I, I mean, I can, I can certainly begin a conversation. I'd love if, if to open it up to, to those listening in as well. If anybody wants to, to comment or, or feedback, um, I can relay those, those questions on. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a, a few of the things that that struck me. I mean, I'm really struck by some of the, 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 uh, the metaphors that you've you've used to think about. Uh, publishing it feels as though it feels as though at every turn you're you're finding ways to sort of query what what are the processes of publishing and what in what ways have they been constructed and and who do they serve and what what uh uh yeah what are the alternative ways that we can we can think about these things and expand them and uh and and open them up to to other uh uses and i really love that idea of the the book as as a prop um uh, really, to to uh, to think of it as always being situated within some um, knowledge situation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's it's it, it speaks to a lot of the things that 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 I've been interested in, and that that um, I guess have come up over the course of the 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 talks program so far. But it, you've you've really articulated so so much uh, such a kind of um, sort of fascinating sort of para project around publishing here. Um, I mean, one of the things that that I'd love to maybe um, ask you about um, is this this uh, this question of participation within publishing. And I know you touch upon it when you're, you're speaking about let's mobilize and and how you actually that 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 fusing of assembly and dissemination, I thought was really um, provocative for me to think about at the point, you know, if if you, to create a collective exercise where a publication is put together, that does sort of fuse these two these two dimensions of of the the, the act of publishing, um, and I I guess I'm yeah I'm I'm really interested in 
yeah, maybe when we break down those barriers, it does allow it does allow for a, a more participatory approach to publishing it. A move away from the author and toward a a, uh, a again a kind of relational or disseminated or distributed version of authorship. So I don't know. That's 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 I, maybe I loads of yeah. <laughs> I would love I would love to talk about this because I actually think using um, the term participatory or participation mm. is really problematic mm. um, because what happens if we think in these terms is um, uh, okay let me let me try to, to, yeah. uh, to uh, think this through um, what it it so there's one there's one person who sets the rules and mm. who sets the project and the structure and then um, this person, often an artist, um, invites other people to participate, but the rules already have been set. Um, so there is, um, um, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to call this collective. So there's a difference between mm. participatory and collective. Um, and also probably between collective and collaborative and participatory. Um, to, to give you one example, with the Library of uh, Inclusions and Omissions, um, mm -hmm. I, I was the one who, had, who wanted to create this uh, resource, who, who wanted to create this library. And I sent out an open call um, and lots and lots of people responded. And um, what I was so interested in is whether I could actually through this project um, connect different communities. That means, could I create um, um, assemblage or a collection of material that is um, so diverse that different communities are coming together through these materials? And it was absolutely naive. I mean, it was just, it was absolutely naive that this could happen because um, the community I'm a member in was interested and contributed and there was very active and lots of stuff happening. So mostly the, the sort of queer feminist, decolonial community around the art college. Um, but because I was setting the rules, um, other communities weren't, um, weren't interested. Like I went to, to the suburbs of Gothenburg where lots, lots and lots of um, um, Arabic immigrants live and I, I went to the schools there and I had chats and um, lately it was so striking that how could I be so naive and think they would be interested because I, as, as Eva Weinmeier, the artist currently um, being at Valand, um, does this project. So they do their own stuff. I mean, it's, um, so what is participation? And um, yeah, I'm interested in, in the power politics in, in this setup. Mm. So I think what, what's, what I'm so interested in is, is, the, um, is the collective practice. And collective practice is like much more messy and, and fundamental because it's also, um, it's also about collectivizing resources, collectivizing cultural capital, collectivizing authorship, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That is really, uh, and I, 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 I've thought a lot about that question about that question about power, the power relationship that's implicit in, in participation. I guess I, yeah, that's that's given me things to think about there as well in terms of, um, uh, yeah, that 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 perhaps when we do talk about participation, we are, we there is an implied power structure, um, uh, and I think, yeah, I think that. Um, that question about power and that question about, I guess I'm also yeah. The other thing I'm interested in there is that the the relationship to the to the institution. Um, I mean, I know I, I you know I, I've been. Um, this is something that that comes up in in kind of discussions about participatory design and and how uh, how the how a relationship how, with uh, an institution can be instrumentalized or can be problematized, um, and. And again, what that means, and what are what are the kind of power structures that that are replicated, or or do you feel that the the institution can be a a space where some of these hierarchies can be diffused, or um, what would you? I mean, I guess I guess what what is your feeling about the institution in relationship to uh, collective publishing and collective knowledge making? 
Um, and that's also a complex question yeah. um, because Sorry. we can think we can think of the institution like in 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 the role of teaching, for example. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a quite clear power structure. We all know. I mean, nobody should try to um, hide that there's a power structure between the teacher and students. And um, and thinking on on these terms, um, uh, talking about participation might actually make sense because it would be really hard to talk about collective practice between a student and a teacher because the power structure is just there. Um, then I, um, thinking about what I actually tried with my PhD mm -hmm. or with, with this inquiry was to formulate like where are these blockages mm. and um, I, I don't have really um, I, I know where the problem is and the problem is that we actually would need to develop different criteria of, of um, evaluation, uh, different taxonomies of value. So it's not the quantity, but it's, it's, it's mm. the process, how we get to this output or to this publication. Um, and there are, there are people working on this. There are more and more people working on this. It's just, it's really complex and it will take time and it will take lots of uh, diff small moves and uh, campaigns and changes in policies in individual institu institutions until this can really um, thrive and, and can can be different. So yeah, it's really policy work, I think. So it's not mm. just practice, it's practice and policy work. Like, mm. um, to, like how do we, uh, for example, how do we assess student work? I mean, do we assess the quality of the outcome or do we assess the learning curve or do we assess um, the include, like how inclusive the, um, um, the, the process was or etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's an interesting discussion After, and yeah i i mean it's something that i have taught a lot i mean certainly the the the, the more time that i spend with these these ideas and processes myself the, the less uh the less the kind of institutional imperative um certainly within education but the less that makes sense i guess i i feel less and less inclined toward that kind of quantitative uh, approach to to teaching and learning um which is sort of imposed so I, I i do i think there's a really profound rethinking of what of what of what knowledge is what and what 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 both teaching and learning um and what pedagogy is and can be here um yeah. and i guess i'm i'm yeah it's something that's um i mean i i did i i i think that the project that that hxdk valent really um exemplified a, a kind of an exercise in exploring an alternative to this, to this, and a kind of critical pedagogy that, uh, that, uh, as you say, it, it sort of reflected back on the structures and and formats as well as the the, the kind of content of what was being discussed um, during that that session. And I, yeah, I mean, one of the things I I suppose I'm interested in at the moment is is where the space might be for that kind of thinking. Um, I mean, it's something that's uh, yeah, within, again, within the kind of um, art institution, within the network of art institutions, that this is, this is something that is being explored in these kind of micro um, experiments and almost like micro utopias, as it were, uh, in, in little pockets. Um, and that, that's not to say that those aren't meaningful and, and rich. Mm. Um, I guess it's, yeah, how do we, how do we take that learning and begin to apply it or to, uh, to extend it? Um, but again, as you say, I, I suppose it's, it's policy as well as practice. Um, mm. And we have to be thinking in, the, in terms of these micro uh, organisms. And I'm, I, and I'm, yeah, I'm really drawn to those, to that use of the, those ecological metaphors that you've, you've. Um, yeah, the compost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That we, I guess if we think of knowledge as this kind of compost or this, 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 um, uh, this, not a, not a swamp exactly, but, but maybe, um, but that there is, uh, uh yeah we, we can we can create these these alternative sorts of formulations yeah. um but it's how to, I, I suppose I'm, I'm i'm also really interested in how to, how to codify that or is there a way to um uh but yeah 
to, to I, I get maybe I'm looking to stabilize something that doesn't and shouldn't be stabilized. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't know that the interesting thing about the compost is and, and the sharing, like sharing as methodology mm. um, is that there, um, so it's, it's, there are outputs and inputs and feeding and digesting and uh, excreting, like they're all uh, on the same level, like they're, they're all uh, valued the same. And um, it's, and and it also creates a, a mutual debt like to be part of this ecology means um you have a you have a there's an interdependency there's yeah there's a relationality and there's is there's um moral and and probably material debt to each other um because if i eat something from you <laughs> like i need to feed you back at some point so yeah. it's it's this ecology and yeah I, I i think it's it's so tempting and it's so inspiring because um it it, it indicates or it points to to an ecology where we can escape uh, the authorship and the ownership and and the copyright and and the yeah. the closure and the proprietary um software and etc cetera, etc cetera. um without and and this is important uh without um falling prey to to somehow some sort of universal idea of openness like that everything can be taken and everything is be free is free and um, available and can be appropriated because I think that's the problem with open so in a way you could say oh yeah the compost that's the open access uh, mm -hmm. movement and policies which are at the moment introduced ev everywhere but it's much more complicated because once you make open access mandatory it creates completely different power structures, and it, it may it may neglect um, that there is no there there. It's a it's it's problematic to have a universalist idea of openness because we might forget that some things can't be taken or shouldn't be taken, especially when it comes to marginalized knowledge or mm. stuff. So it's it's a really Western modern colonial idea everything universally is free and and open so and the compost doesn't do that uh, because mm. um, there are different forces sort of controlling and and at play yes so this is a way of thinking relationally that that is not uh that is not universalizing um yeah. uh i think that's i think there's something really um uh yeah there's a there are really profound implications here for thinking about 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 knowledge and uh i mean far beyond not to say far beyond publishing but uh and not to 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 uh but it it does it it yeah i guess it, it this is a very expansive way of thinking about publishing and what it what it can entail um uh and yet it's also there it comes out of this focus on, as you say, you, out of this focus on what it means to to uh, disseminate rather than distribute knowledge, um, which is happening at a micro level all the time with with publishing experiments and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, for me, there's an awful lot to to kind of uh, uh, think about actually, and um, uh, and take away. Um, yeah, I mean, I I I. I I I don't see questions coming in, and I'm I, I'm sure people are. Uh, uh, there's the sun is still shining here, so I, I guess people might be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep people beyond the the uh, allotted time. Although I know we could we could talk a lot more. Um, I know Una had came in to say, um, uh, and Jennifer says we are thinking as well. Um, yeah, I think. Well, I I I think maybe we thinking is remote. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and Una says, yes, she's so interested in this idea of disrupting publishing ecologies and extending participation and authorship. Um, I, I think, um, uh, yes, and we've, we have, I think everybody has that sense that we want to go away and, and have a think about these, these alternative approaches. Um, 
I mean, at that, I, I, I guess we can, we can, we can leave it there. Eva, that was really, really wonderful, though. And I, I, I hope I do want to, you know, I, I did add a link to the PDF if people want to have a look oh, at that, that right, product. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that out, uh, that output from that. Let's mobilize. Um, uh, uh, three-day event and um, so I would encourage people to, to download and have a look at us um, because uh, it's it's really um, and I know you were you were talking about the, you know the mobilization was more important than the, the the book than the object but for me that to have that record yeah um, is is really extraordinary as well um, okay I guess we will we will leave it there um, thanks again Eva I I, uh, I am really just yeah I feel a bit inarticulate trying to kind of process this and and respond, but I, I, I that was so enjoyable. Um, and thanks everybody for listening in and for joining us. Uh, I do want to say there's there's one more event that'll that'll be happening to, as a kind of closing panel for the the program. Um, that'll be happening on the 14th of May. So there's a couple of uh, writers and artists um, speaking about publishing in relation to uh, to place performance uh, and participation is the other um, node there which actually you've really helpfully complicated I think Eva for 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 us um, so uh, visual artist Adam Gibney will be speaking uh, poet Juliet Morrissey and then uh, the Belfast based publishing collective soft publishing um, so yeah if people want to join in uh, for that that would be great so thanks again thank you Eva for that spectacular presentation thanks everybody for listening and I'll, I'll let you all go and enjoy what's left of the, the sunshine <laughs> Thank you Thanks. all. Thanks, Nick. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.